glad to be with you again today for our learning series, Face to Face. If this is your first time joining us at Revive Online, thank you so much. And I wanna introduce myself. My name is Stephen Kilgore. I'm the lead pastor here at Revive Church in Arlington, Texas. And I've got a word for you. I believe that God has something to speak to you today. Before I get into that though, I wanna encourage everybody, if you're on revivechurch.live, if you are on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching from, share this with someone right now. Text a few people, text the link out or invite some people to watch with you because you are going to want to walk away from this having a conversation about it. It's going to be a short message, but a sweet message. And then also, if you want to uh, connect with us online as well through the week, I want to encourage you, download the Revive Church app, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. That way you'll know what's going on with the church and how you can be involved in what God's doing at Revive. And last but certainly not least, I just want to take a second and say thank you. Thank you to every person who's able to give right now, those who are employed. Thank you for tithing consistently through these past couple months especially. Thank you for being generous, not just with Revive Church, church, but thank you for being generous with those who are in need. Because every time you give to Revive Church, we set aside a minimum of 10% as what we call our church tithe, and we put it into something called our Love Your Neighbor Fund. And that money in the Love Your Neighbor Fund goes out to help people who are in need. It goes out to missions organizations, charitable organizations. And right now, for the past several weeks, we have been helping people through this crisis financially, helping them pay rent, utilities, food costs, all of the above. So thank you so much. And I want to encourage you, if right now where you're at, you say, I want to be a part of what Revive's doing and I want to invest in this, go to give.revivechurch.com or use the Revive app and you can help us. Not only are we giving to people and being generous, but we're also planning for the future. As you might have noticed for the past couple of weeks, we've been online, strictly online, and we are building something brand new. We're building our online community through your giving. Behind the scenes, what we've been doing is we've been buying some equipment, we are strategizing, we are thinking about how we can continue engaging people online when we start meeting in person again. I know all of you were just like, oh my God, did he say uh, in-person meeting? I did, and I'll have some information for you on that in the next couple weeks, so check your emails if you're on our email list, or check, like I said, Facebook or Instagram. We'll have information for you. But I don't wanna get into that. I just wanna thank everybody for giving and encourage you. Give something today to help us continue what God is doing here at Revive Church. I wanna get into our learning series called Face to Face, and maybe you're new with us today. We call what we do, when I teach, when I preach, when we have guest speakers, we call it a learning series. We take topics from the Bible and we just hone in on them and we dig deep into them. And we call it a learning series because we think you should be learning something when you go to church or when you're learning from someone, from a pastor or a preacher. We don't think they should be teaching series because sometimes teaching is boring. And so I don't wanna bore you today. I wanna engage you. I wanna speak directly to the situation you are in. And I wanna show you that God has you in his heart right now. He has something specific he wants to say to you. The concept is very simple. In face-to-face, -face, this learning series, face-to-face, -face, we're looking at people in the Bible who have had face-to-face -face encounters with God. And the reason why is because whenever you read through the scriptures and you see where someone has a face-to-face -face encounter, God shows up in some form to humanity, everything changes. Normal is diverted and normal is transformed. And what I believe is in the year 2020, everything changed drastically. We had no warning. We didn't have no face-to-face, -face, no angels, no trumpets, no nothing. God was just like, okay, let's see what you do. And as normal began to shift and change and divert itself, and our attention went with it. And what I think we need to do is get our attention back on a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And if we can see in the Bible how God moves when normal shifts and how we need to respond when normal shifts, then we will stop living in fear. We will stop living with timidity. We will stop living with an escapist attitude and we will begin trusting God again, knowing that we don't have to rely on the government to reopen businesses and reopen churches and all this other stuff. We don't have to rely on a vaccine. We can rely on our God. 
Today, I want to get right into the Bible. I don't got any short quips or stories for you. I just want to get right into the Bible because this is one of my favorite stories in the book of Judges chapter 6. If you have an old school Bible, paper Bible, get that out. It'll be less distracting for you while I'm preaching. If you have your phone, though, with you, I want to encourage you while you're scrolling through Instagram while I preach, I already caught you. I want to encourage you. Go ahead, take some pictures, videos, tag me, tag the church on Instagram. Let us know that you're watching and share it with someone. And then I also want to ask you to do me a favor after this message is done, would you share a short video about how this message impacted you so that others can get on board with what God is doing? Because I believe this is going to speak to some people. Here we are, Judges chapter 6, and it starts out with a real sad story. In verse 1, this is what it says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. This is a Debbie Downer story right here, just from the get-go. Judges 6.1, the Israelites were doing evil in the sight of God. And so he said, hey, you want to do evil? You don't want to do things my way? That's fine. I'll lift my hand of favor off of you, and I'm going to turn you over for seven years to the Midianites. And the Midianites were bad dudes. These were bad, bad people. They did not believe in the same God as the Israelites. They had no morals. They had no ethics. In fact, they joined with some surrounding nations to attack the Israelites. It got so bad that if the Israelites were found producing crops, they would come in and burn the crops. If they had livestock, they would come in and kill the livestock. It gets so bad that it says in the Bible that they were forced into poverty. In verse 6, here's what it says, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. I don't know about you, but I can just imagine this scenario. No one is employed. No one has a job. No one has any money coming on in. And, and these are agricultural people. They're farmers. They're raising cattle and sheep and goats and camels. And surrounding nations are coming in and they're attacking and they're taking out the economy. They're taking out the livelihood. They're taking out family members. They're burning down homes. They're burning down farms. Everything is bleak. And in the Old Testament... What you see is when God allowed the Israelites to go through a season where a warring nation came in and took over, eventually someone would be raised up by God to rescue the people. And what I think is happening here in the book of Judges is it says that because they were so impoverished, in other words, they hit rock bottom and they realized they had no way out. And so they finally went to God. Now that might preach to somebody because some of us have been in that situation. We are go- we're walking through hell, but we wait till we get to the very lowest layer of hell to finally say, God, will you rescue me? But I kind of imagine, uh, imagine their prayers being something like this. I don't imagine them going, God, rescue us. I-, I imagine them asking God to send someone, to raise someone up to rescue them. I imagine them going through their their minds and thinking through the history of the Israelite nation and saying, God, would you raise up an Abraham, the father of our faith? Would you raise up an Isaac, the promised son? Would you raise up a Jacob, the one who wrestled with God? Would you raise up a Joseph, a dreamer? Would you send us a Moses, the one who led us out of slavery? Or would you send us a Joshua, the one who led us into the promised land? Here's what God does. God responds to their prayers by raising up a Gideon. That's right, a Gideon. Now, you may not have heard this name before. Gideon is not one of the most well-known people in the Bible. Now, his story is taught in churches, but not as much as like Jesus, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all the names I just named. Gideon is just like one of these guys that just kind of shows up on the scene, and he's not the one you expect God to choose. Here's what Gideon's story starts out like. In Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah, not Oprah, Ophrah, that belonged to Joash, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you mighty warrior. Now, I know you're thinking, but Stephen, this is a face-to-face encounter with God, and the Bible says the angel of the Lord. What you have to understand is in Hebrew terminology, the angel of the Lord, that term is used interchangeably with the Lord himself. And so 
Historians and theologians believe that this term angel of the Lord is actually referring to the Lord himself, but they're using this term angel of the Lord. He says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon said, hold up, uh, if the Lord is with us, why has the Midianite nation overpowered us? Why is all this happening to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about? Didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. And Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Please don't go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I'll wait until you return. I love the story of Gideon. Because his face-to-face -face encounter with God is such a strong reflection of human nature. It's amazing what fear will cause us to do because Gideon is a man living in fear. And he's not just living in fear because there's a threat from the Midianite nation. He's living in fear because of his identity. He's living in fear because of how he has been identified in his own eyes. If you go back and read what we just read, when God says, I'm sending you to save Israel, what is his response? Yo, do you know who I am? Obviously you don't, because no one else does. I'm Gideon. My family is the weakest clan in the country. And I am the weakest of the weakest clan in the country. He's living in fear because his identity has told him that he is the weakest, the smallest, the scroungiest. He is nobody. He is nothing worth looking at. His, his identity has caused him to act in a way that is outside of God's intent for him. But not just the way that God ordained his life, but also practicality is changed in Gideon's life. What's astounding to me is that in the middle of a season of poverty and oppression, Gideon holds the identity for the weakest man in the land. And it's his identity that drives him to thresh wheat in a wine press. Now, for those of us living in 2020 who don't do this on a daily basis, we may not even know what the word thresh means. Threshing wheat is the process where you get the grain from the stalk of wheat. And here's what it looks like. Farmers will take the wheat back in these days, do it by hand. They would gather bundles of wheat and they would put it in bags on the threshing floor and they would begin to beat the wheat, beat the wheat, beat the wheat. And all of the, 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 the extra parts of the wheat would fall off of the stalk until there was only a little bit of grain. At the bottom of the bag would be the grain and then all of the chaff would just blow away off the threshing floor. What Gideon is doing though is he's using a wine press. A wine press, on the other hand, is, is used to contain anything that goes into it. I, I just immediately go back, and this may like super date me, but I'm thinking of I Love Lucy, one of the funniest episodes of I Love Lucy. By the way, you young bucks who don't know I Love Lucy, you need to go watch some I Love Lucy. It will make you laugh. I Love Lucy is when she gets caught uh, having to make wine with her bare feet. And she gets into this big giant bucket, a wine press, and she begins to just beat down on the grapes and it begins to make wine. This is what a wine press does. It contains all of the juices from the grapes to create wine. What Gideon is doing is he's taking the wheat and he's throwing it in a wine press so that all that chaff, that nasty part of the wheat that you don't need because you really want the grain is getting stuck in there. Why is he doing that? He's doing it because he's afraid that if the Midianites see chaff in the air, they will come find him, kill him, and take his wheat. And I want to tell you, when your identity is rooted in fear, you will misuse the tools and the resources that God has given you in hopes that no one will see what you're capable of. There are some people you lived your entire life with an identity that was opposite of what God intended for your life, and you will not accept that identity because you know that if you do, someone will get a whiff of the chaff that you're blowing into the wind because of of your success and they will get mad at you and they will disown you and they will begin to curse you and God is calling you out of the wine press and back to the threshing floor where he intended for you to be in the first place. Don't let fear drive you away from success 
in this season. Don't let fear drive you to the wine press. Don't contain all of the images and the visions and the production that God has put in your heart right now. That's not even the message, but I feel like somebody needed to have that. So uh, this is where I want to go, though. It's God's opening statement to Gideon that mystifies me. His opening statement to Gideon is this, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Many times, if you've ever heard a message about Gideon, you'll hear that the Lord is showing up to Gideon, this weakling, a guy who's fearful and, and threshing wheat in a wine press. And you'll say, you'll hear them say this, that God was making a faith statement, that the God who calls things that are not as though they were, who gives life to the dead, was calling Gideon a mighty warrior. Now, I think that there may be some truth in that, but I have a different approach in this message. I'm going to go against the grain, no pun intended, and I want to preach today that maybe God was not making a faith statement. This may hurt some people's feelings. You may watch this and be like, you are uprooting my Sunday school childhood experience here. But maybe God was not actually making a faith statement. Maybe God was not calling things that are not as though they were. Maybe God was not speaking by faith. I want to show you what I mean. I want to point out three statements that the Lord made in this short conversation with Gideon that may relate to a previous situation, a current condition, or a future season in your life. Because sometimes I believe that what we're waiting on is God to speak a faith statement over us. And maybe God is not going to speak that over you. Maybe he's going to make one of these three statements to get you to go where he needs you. The first statement is this, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, again, I don't know that the Lord was making a faith statement, if I can just be honest. I see the appeal in that thought. I see that that makes a really good message. I see that it does line up with the book of Romans that God calls things that are not as though they were. I get that, but here's the truth. Gideon is a coward. He is a weakling. He is threshing wheat in a wine press. He is scared of the warring nations. If you go read later in the story right after this, his father has built an altar to Baal. Like they are serving the wrong God on top of it. I mean, he is a traitor to his own religion, to his own people, to his own nation. He is a nobody. You're just sitting there right now going, Stephen, what kind of a message is this? Just stick with me. He's a nobody. He's a coward. He's not a mighty warrior. I disagree with God. I said it. Yes, I said it. I disagree with God. Gideon is not a mighty warrior. When God shows up and he has a face-to-face -face encounter with Gideon, at this moment, he is not a mighty warrior. You might be saying, but yeah, that, but God was making a faith statement. Wait a minute. Maybe that's not what was happening here. In fact, I, I want you to see something. When God says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior, Gideon doesn't even acknowledge that title. He does not even respond to the fact that God called him a mighty warrior. If you go back and you look at how Gideon responds, he responds to the first half of that statement, not the latter part. He says, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of of Midian. This is why I don't believe that God is making a faith statement. I believe he's making a face-to-face -face statement. I believe that up until this point, Gideon was not a mighty warrior, not by faith, not by hope, not by nothing. What I believe is that we focus, when we learn about this story, we focus way too much on the title that God gave Gideon in relation to Gideon's identity and not enough on the preceding statement in relation to God's whereabouts. Because what God said was, first, the Lord is with you. Then he added, mighty warrior. In other words, let me put it to you this way. Until God showed up, Gideon was nothing. 
Until God made his appearance, Gideon was a coward. Until God said, I am with you, Gideon was just a little boy, a weakling in the middle of a wine press, threshing wheat, doing something outside of his purpose. He was a nobody until God showed up. This is why I think that Gideon just disregarded the statement of mighty warrior. But he did focus on God's whereabouts. God, if you were really with us, why are we going through this? I think this right here is the question that a lot of people are asking. God, if you're really with me, God, if you're really for me, why did I lose my job? Why am I suffering? Why am I walking through this? Can I tell you something? We live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. And when you study out the Bible, here's what the Bible tells us about sin. Sin opened the door for all this chaos. God doesn't cause this. God doesn't want it to happen, but God is not a dictator. And can I tell you, if your complaint is, God, why didn't you prevent this? You have to take it both ways. You can't ask God to be a dictator of preventing things and then not ask him to be a dictator in your life to make you do things that he wants you to do. You gotta take both sides of the coin, honey, if that's your prayer. The reality is, this is where Gideon's heart was. He said, God, if you're really with us, why is all this happening? God shows up first. He says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Then God, if you're with us, why is all this happening? And here's his second statement. Go in the strength you have. I love this statement because for me, this is an indication to me that God knows my limitations. I, I, I used to think that faith means that I had no limitations. You know, the whole scripture, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That Bible verse is not saying that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Because if that was a broad brush of all things, you could do some things that were sinful through Christ who strengthens you. And that's not what the Bible means. In fact, you need to go read all of Philippians 4 to understand Philippians 4, 13. But I used to think that. I used to think that by faith, I can do all things. Here's what I learned, though. I learned that because God created me, because God designed me, and because I have an intimate relationship with him, God has designed me with some limitations. God's okay with my limitations. When he tells Gideon, go ahead and go in the strength that you have, I don't believe that this is a strength-inducing statement as much as it is a strength-identifying statement. I believe that God is letting Gideon know, I know your limitations. I know how much strength you have and how much you don't have. I don't think that God said go with invincibility superpowers. I don't think God was saying go with your 40 years of combat training. I don't think that God was saying go with the strength that you have. He's saying go with the strength that you don't have. You don't have influence, Gideon, so go. You don't have power, Gideon. So go. You don't have the resources, Gideon. So go. Gideon confirms what he doesn't have with his response. Pardon me, Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. I want to wake somebody up today in 2020. By the way, if you're watching this five years from now, this may not apply to you in the season you're in, but for all of us, every single one of us, there's not one of us in 2020 who does not feel this right now. I want to wake you up to the idea that you may be the weakest of your clan. You may feel the weakest of your clan, but here's what God is telling you. Some people out there today, God is still telling you to go in the strength that you have. And let me say it this way. God is telling you to go with what you don't have. God is telling you to go with what you don't have. God is willing to send some of us out in faith, in his purpose, and in his strength with our limited strength because his, he knows what we're going to do. Here's a big statement that a lot of people tend to make, and I hate this because it's a misinterpretation of Scripture. One of the most famous misinterpretations of the Bible, I should say mis not misinterpretations, but misquoted verses of the Bible is this. God will not allow you to handle, or, or God will not allow you to take on more than you can handle. God will not allow you to take on more than you can handle. Now, that's a play on words from the actual scripture that says this, that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. Because when you are tempted, he will provide a way out. And that passage of scripture is talking about because Jesus 
he was tempted by all the same things that we were tempted by, that we can have a way out in our relationship with Jesus because of our faith in Christ, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to succumb to temptation. But people take it and they misquote it and they say, God will not allow you to go through more than you can handle. And can I tell you, that's the biggest lie. In fact, my experience in my life is God tends to wait for me to get to a place where I'm comfortable to throw way more on me than I can handle. I know that doesn't sound encouraging, but just stick with me here for a second. There's a lot of times in my life, God called me to start a church and he said, go in the strength you do have. I didn't feel like I had much strength for that. God tells me to come preach every week and sometimes I don't have the strength for it. In fact, just today while we're recording this message, I did not feel the strength to preach this message. There are times in my life, there are a lot of people who are waiting to step out in faith because they're waiting on God to give them the resource they think that they need to fulfill their purpose when in reality, God is calling you to step out with the thing that you don't have, the resources you don't have, the connections you don't have, the finances you don't have. And that may not make sense because wouldn't God want to provide everything for me before I step out? No, because that's not how faith works. God is calling Gideon to save the nation of Israel, and his exact phrasing is this, go in the strength you have. Here's why God said that, because first he comes to Gideon, and he says, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Secondly, he says, go in the strength you have, and when Gideon looks at him like he's crazy, he responds with this, I will be with you. Oh, my goodness. Not only am I with you now, but I will be with you. I don't know if you caught this, but God's conversation, this face-to-face -face encounter with Gideon, it starts out with the Lord is with you. It ends with the Lord will be with you. It starts out with I am with you. It ends with I will continue to be with you. Gideon's purpose begins and ends with one simple idea, God is with you. Gideon's battle begins and ends with one simple idea. God is with you. Gideon's weakness begins and ends with one simple idea. God is with you. Gideon's strength begins and ends with one simple idea. God is with you. Every time you step out in faith to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God, the one thing that God will not allow you to forget is that he is with you. He can't promise you that every circumstance will be peachy, rainbows, and unicorns. He cannot guarantee that you won't have to fight a battle. He cannot, he won't guarantee it in fact, because Jesus even said every day has enough trouble of its own. But the one promise he will never stray from is this, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. God is with you. And to Gideon's response, he says, but God, if you were with us all this time, why has all this happened? And God doesn't even blink. He doesn't respond to the accusation. He simply says, go in the strength you have, and I will remain with you. I will continue to be with you. I will continue to walk with you. Some of you right now in the middle of this season are having these ideas for businesses, having these ideas for new employment opportunities, having these ideas of a better marriage when you come out or getting married when you come out, having kids, whatever it might be. And your thought process right now is if God wanted me to have these things, he'd give them to me first before I step out in faith. But can I tell you something? The promise of God is not that he's going to give you everything you want. The promise of God is that he will be with you as you walk in faith, as you persevere in faith. That might not feel encouraging today, but it is the greatest promise of God is that he would be with us. Because I've been through some situations in life, and there are some people from my past who are not in my present, and there are people in my present who won't be in my future. But one thing is true. My God said he would never leave me nor forsake me. And when I look back over those seasons that I lost some people from season to season, when people blew away with the wind, or when things got hard, they said, I can't help you carry this. My God 
God stood with me. His grace stayed with me. His power stayed with me. His spirit didn't leave me. His grace grew in me. And I am who I am today because God promised me that he was going to be with me. My encouragement to you today in this short little message is not that life is going to get easier tomorrow. It's not that life is going to get easier a year from now. I'm not going to guarantee that because I'd be a liar if I could guarantee that for every single person who watches this message. But there is one thing I will guarantee you, that it does not matter what you do, breathing your last breath or taking your first. God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. God might call you to go save the nation. He will be with you. God will call you to start a business. He will be with you. God will start calling you to have a kid. He will be with you. God's going to call you to do some things in your life that are uncomfortable, that are not easy, that do not feel right, that go against your knowledge, go against your experience, go against your education, go against your socioeconomic status, go against the color of your skin, go against your political affiliation. But here's the greatest promise. God will be with you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He ain't going nowhere, baby. It doesn't matter how far you run from him. He's right there behind you. He's beside you. He's above you. He's below you. You can keep making stupid decisions. I've done it. And God will remain with you. Because when you choose to surrender and submit to the word of God on your life, when you choose to submit to the purpose of God on your life, when you choose to submit to that wrestling match, when you have your face-to-face -face encounter with God, God might not say some things that you enjoy. He may not promise you that 365 days from now, everything will be different from you and your life will never be hard again. But one thing he will make sure is ingrained in the DNA of your soul is that I am with you. And if you can catch the revelation that God is with you, then everything you think you need will fall to the wayside because there's only one thing you need in trial and tribulation, in victory and celebration, and that is the presence of the everlasting, almighty, never-ending, powerful, omnipotent, omniscient God, Jesus Christ, the power of his Holy Spirit on you. So I want to encourage you, if this excites you, if this encourages you, this week you need to have a face-to-face -face encounter with God because you need a reminder when you leave your knees after praying to God, when you leave your prayer closet, that God was with you in the closet. He's coming with you as you leave that prayer closet. God is going to be with you as you step into the next season. God's going to be with you as you look for a new job. God's going to be with you in this next season of life. God will never leave you nor forsake you. By the way, this is why we can't meet in person because I spit too far when I preach. You wouldn't be happy. I coronavirus, we just can't have that. Because when you read the end of Gideon's story, my favorite part of this story is that the Bible says that after Gideon left this face-to-face -face encounter with God and God said, I am with you. Go in the strength you have. In other words, go with what you don't have. Don't worry about everything you need. Don't worry about everything you think you need. Don't worry about the resources, the influence, the power, the money. Don't worry about all of that. I'm calling you to do something, so I'm sending you out. The only thing you need is what you already have and what you don't have because what you don't have will be filled in by me. He says, I will be with you. And when you keep reading through the book of Judges and you read about Gideon's life and you read about the encounters that God had, there's one verse that stands out. It says that Gideon was swept by or he was overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you something? Gideon went on to save the nation of Israel. Stephen, how does this apply to, to normal being shifted? I'm glad you asked. Because up until this point, Whenever God raised somebody up, he raised people up who already had the acumen to lead. He raised people up who already had the faith inside of them. Abraham, the father of our faith, who left his father's household, not even knowing where God was sending him. He just said, okay, I'm going to go, sure, whatever. Isaac, the, the chosen son who saw through his father how God moved. And so he knew he could trust God. Jacob, who chose to wrestle with God, to believe that he was blessed. Joseph, the dreamer, who saved not only the nation of Israel, but of Egypt as well, became second in command of the nation of, of Egypt. And Moses, who, yeah, he was a complainer, he was a stutterer, but that man knew how to stand his ground. And Joshua, 
a warrior, a strategist, a great man of God. And after all of them are gone and all of them die, the nation of Israel is seeking out the next leader of the nation who will save us, who will lead us. And God finds the weakest member of the weakest clan. He looks at him and he says, yeah, this is the one. I want to shift normal. I no longer want people to believe that if you just speak a statement of faith, you can be a mighty warrior. I don't want people to believe that you have to be prepared for the battle. I want them to understand that when I step onto the scene, you are made a mighty warrior. When you come face to face with me, you are made into what I have called you to be. So your challenge is you need to go with what you don't have because God is with you. And if you're watching this today and this resonates with you, you feel something in your heart today, you've never heard that before, that God is with you. In fact, you've lived most of your life feeling like God isn't for you, that he's distant from you. Can I tell you the good news of the Bible, the good news of what we say, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that God desired a relationship with you so strongly that he sent Jesus down in the flesh, God in flesh, to show us how intimate of a relationship he desired. He wanted to be face to face with us all the time. Not only that, but Jesus was sent down to this earth to remove any separation there was between us and him. The one thing that separates us from God is our sinful nature. It's all the dumb things we've done. Every time we've broken one of God's laws, every time we've broken one of God's commands, it slowly puts a gap between us and God. And if you don't recognize the saving grace of Jesus Christ, you'll never realize that he bridged that gap for you and for me. That's the good news. Jesus came to die on a cross for our sins. He took the punishment. He bridged that gap so that we would have complete and total access to God. But it only happens if we choose to surrender to Jesus. It only happens if we put our faith in Jesus. In fact, in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved because it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And so I want to encourage you today to choose to put your faith, your belief in the fact that Jesus came to this earth, died for our sins, he was raised from the dead, and that same spirit that raised him from the dead is accessible to you and me. I wanna encourage you today to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That means that you put Jesus first. You choose to follow him. Your life is in line with Jesus. You wanna learn about him. You wanna have a healthy, loving relationship with God through Jesus. You wanna know the principles of life through Jesus. This is how you're gonna get complete and total access to God. And I would love, I would be honored if I could lead you in a prayer very quickly, very simply, line by line. I wanna ask you to repeat after me, but if at any time in this conversation that you're having with God, repeating after me, you say, you know what? I need to talk to God myself. I wanna encourage you, go ahead, have that conversation. Pause me, mute me, but come back at the end of this because we have your next step as well. Just do this, repeat after me. Say, Father God, I come to you today knowing I've messed up, knowing there's been a gap. I'm asking you to remove the gap. I choose to follow Jesus. I believe that Jesus was sent to die for my sins, that he was raised from the dead, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Say, Jesus, you're number one. I choose to follow you. I commit my life to you. Thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins, all of my past, my present, and my future. I commit my life to you, but I can't do it perfectly. So I ask you, give me the gift of your Holy Spirit 
Live in me, Holy Spirit. Give me the power to choose you over every selfish desire, to choose you over every sin. I thank you that I am free, I am loved, and today I am a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, let me tell you something. I'm stinking excited for you because this is the start, the day one of your new relationship with Jesus. And I want to tell you something. I want to encourage you. You did this right where you are. Maybe you're at home. Maybe you're in the car. Maybe you're at work. Maybe you're out at a park. I, I don't know. But I want you to notice something. You didn't make that decision in a church building because a church building does not dictate your relationship with Jesus. But here's what it does do. It helps you through your relationship with Jesus. It helps you grow spiritually. So I want to encourage you and I want to invite you to be a part of Revive Online. And if you're in the DFW area, when we reopen, I want to ask you to come join us in person. Get around some other people who can help you grow in your relationship with God. This day one experience is awesome. But can I tell you something? Tomorrow might be a little different. There might be an attack on your life. Things may not be, like I said, perfect. But the one promise you need a constant reminder of is that God is with you. And you're going to find that in community with other people. I want to just tell you, thank you for joining us today. And I'm excited that God is about to do something in your life you will never, ever forget. The Lord bless you, keep you, and make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. God, lift up your countenance upon your people. Grant us grace and peace in Jesus' name. Amen.